So, another night hacking session. Welcome uh, to yeah last day of JFocus, and with me is Gert. Well, how how should I spell it right? Is it Gert? Gert. Gert. Yeah. Bevin. 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 Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, some people of you might know him. I'm pretty sure from. Uh, different conferences when this was the guy playing an instrument and, and also can explain how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, it, it's, uh, that's very interesting. So maybe you would like to explain something, how you came to music and what you, are you doing with music and why okay. it, you also use it f with the computer. So um, I think I've been doing music and programming since I was 12, oh, okay. both of them. Mm -hmm. um, but at that time, Electronic music was still in its infancy, um, and it was pretty clear that you either had to choose to be a musician or be a, you know, something yeah, else. Yeah, doesn't really fit together, right? And <laughs> like any kid, um, I had this wild dream of being a rock star. <laughs> so well, you um, are, I saw you at Java One last year. You yeah. are a rock star. <laughs> So I went into music because that was, the, at that time, the easiest path. Very difficult, though, but it seemed the easiest path towards becoming a rock star. Um, but I continued doing you know, computer stuff, mm -hmm. and I always liked programming. And um, I built my first commercial app when I was 16, which was like on the side. And it paid for okay. my musical instruments. Um, mm -hmm. All that was just by chance. but. I decided to go into music studies and to try to become a professional musician, which didn't really work out that well. <laughs> um, it was very hard to pay the bills. Until one night, um, it always happens at a bar, right? Yeah. The, the coolest stuff happens at a bar. <laughs> so one night at 2 a.m. In, in a bar in the center of Brussels, um, pretty far along with the alcohol, I was sitting next to another guy and we were chatting all night and it turns out that he just started a company with his brother who was an amazing Java programmer oh. at the time. It was the time of Java 1.0 and he really got it and so uh, his name was uh, Alain Rogister and um, so together with his brother Fabrice they started this company where they wanted to build custom solutions with Java and I was doing Perl and uh, you know the initial phases of CGI programming mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I said, well, I've built websites. If you want to build websites, I could probably learn Java. And um, because I really needed the money. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so, like. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he said, well, why don't you come over tomorrow? I said, OK. So next morning, we were both still a little bit drunk. Um, I showed up at the office. and got introduced to his brother who kind of took me under his wings and um, taught me the ropes in terms of professional programming. Oh. Um, and, and that's where it actually started. It's all like a, a whole series of chance encounters and um, very scary undertakings like, okay, first conference talks, the first conference talk in the US for um, okay. first big projects, first uh, 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 products for mobile phone companies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it always like went one up until it allowed me in this day and age to actually use electronic music now as one of the driving okay. forces of my uh, programming career. Um, because I, I had a chance to, about five years ago, to work for a company called Eigen Labs, who built this instrument, if you've seen me before, um, called the Eigen Harp. Um, and so that instrument is a, a very expressive electronic instrument. That, allows that was you the to one really that you used at DevOx yes. two years ago? Yes. Oh, that yes. was very impressive. Yes. yes, I saw that. Very, very expressive, very difficult to play, though. Um, and so I got the opportunity to work with them. And I actually learned so much from that because Working on a physical product as a programmer is something yeah. you don't often have the opportunity to do. And then a physical product that's actually emotional because you're making music with right. it. Um, and I really learned so much from that. And now, now I'm back to pure software as a, uh, as a uh, product manager at Zero Turnaround working on our x product. But I really feel that Having worked on physical products and having worked with users that are passionate about physical products, because musicians are passionate people. Absolutely. Um, 
it helped me and it still helps me so much to um, to put our products at Zero Turnaround in the right mindset. Mm -hmm. to, to try to feel what the users need, what they want, how they're going to use it. I think this is really the life. difference when you interact with, with hardware directly. Yes. So it's, it's not, not like some piece of code running in the background. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever sees it except the developers, but it's, you can interact with your code yep. through the hardware, which is, it must be amazing if you use music, right? Like yes, yes, because music allows people to, to surpass themselves. If you build something that allows them to, to reach an expressive state that... I, I like this, um, this very historical term, being a genius. Actually, you mm. were initially... Um, so nowadays we call people geniuses, but historically that's not where the word came from. It's like people had moments of genius. They're, they were like possessed by a higher force, that's what the tribes mm -hmm. thought, that passed through them and were able to express them at one point in time to surpass their, their own being and become so emotional that they touched everyone around them. Um, and being able to as a programmer, work on products that enable people to do that, it's a great feeling. Okay, well that sounds really interesting. So, um, because you also, you, you directly code the, on the hardware side, right? Well, um, with the, Eigen, the Eigenharp, so the first instrument that I worked on is called the Eigenharp, mm -hmm. um, I didn't code the hardware side. So, okay. the way the instrument was designed, uh, because in that, that time, about when they started designing it, it was probably about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. There were no embedded processors that were really fast enough. Um, so they're because they use optics, right? Inside they use optical sensors yeah. underneath the keys, um, which are extremely sensitive mm -hmm. and send out a boatload of data. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's almost like uh, uh, a studio recording of audio data, but coming out as digital data. Yeah, and, and also then it, still has it, it had a lot audio. of keys, so it was not just 32 yeah. keys, <laughs> okay. each key <laughs> moving in three axes, so in, yeah. out, up, down, left, right. Um, and so their design was to stream out all the data as fast as possible over uh, their own serial connection mm -hmm. um, to a computer, a general purpose computer, and then the software oh. on the computer actually got the data as fast as possible without any filtering, without any... Well, there was initial filtering on the hardware to get like the, the first Special noise level out, oh, right? okay. first filters to okay. get the noise level out of, because you've got inherent uh, frequencies of material. Sure. If you yeah. hit some wood, they, it will vibrate yeah. and that was going into the signal. So you've got that initial, initial stage of signal processing was then done on the hardware, sending out all that data straight to the computer. Um, and from that point onwards, I worked on the software there that was run, that ran and still runs on the um, Max, uh, Windows, but now also on Linux, um, that allows you that, that allowed the Eigenharp actually to send that data and use a general, very powerful computer at that time. The most powerful computers yeah. that we have are desktop machines or laptops to process that data and then make musical sense out of it. Okay, so that means this instrument wasn't able to run without a computer. No, you always had to have a computer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so but now you're working for another company yep, on the, another product. So yep. it's uh, called the Linstrument. Yes, let me show you what it is. Yeah, we can show it. It's uh, it's so also very interesting. So this, this is this is the Linstrument. It's like um, it's it seems like a pad device. Like yeah, it you looks know, like the, right? these DJs DJ touch pads. pads yeah, 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 yeah. What is very different though is, and a lot of people are confused by that is. You think that there are individual squares, but actually it's not. It's a continuous surface, and this is just a silicon sheet that has grooves in it. You can you can feel it. So you see oh, yeah, that okay. it, the sheet is actually going on. Yeah. Um, so, so it is a continuous can really, it's, it's surface. It's like one yeah. one surface. It's, you oh, can okay. you can think of it as a as a touch screen, but that has like, yeah, okay. You, you can feel it. So that means the squares just define some discrete positions that you exactly. if you would like to make sure it's exactly that yep. thing, then this 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 position. Yep. Oh, so okay. it's x x. This is the x position. This is the y okay. position. But also has z, which is very okay. different from a touch screen. So oh, again, okay. you've got three axes for each touch, and it it will track all of your touches. So it's really the pressure that you yep. put on. Oh, okay. So you can expressively press down and articulate. Mm -hmm. in, most instruments, physical instruments in the real world, they have that sense of um, continu con 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 
continuity where you yeah. start and like if you blow in a saxophone, your uh, the air will blow yeah. through and it always starts from zero and then it goes back to zero. Mm -hmm. um, same thing if you pluck on a guitar, you will you will start your emotion and your emotion will start from nothing and then you will hit a string mm -hmm. and that will create a sound. Yeah, it's not like on off. It's exactly. A, it's really, yeah. So that is that is a very big difference with this instrument and the Agen harp in uh, in that everything is continuous and the way it is doing this is by being very fast. Okay. So before, um, people were always, and still, most, most digital instruments use on-off switches because it's very difficult to get a data stream that's fast enough to, to, do, to model this, yeah. right? Your hands clapping is extremely fast. You have this, yeah, this spike peak, in the beginning, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. And you, you have to be able to sample that. You have to be able to sample the motion yeah. and be fast enough to get all the points to make it um, expressive. But but doesn't mean that in this instrument you have uh, you have a CPU. Yes. So in the instrument, since now we're ten years later, right? Um, it turned out that the most powerful Arduino Due, which is run, which runs at 84 megahertz, it's not that much, but it's with the right algorithms, it just works. Wow, that's uh, it's impressive. Right, it's right on the edge, but so we're able to get it to work. So this instrument is running on an Arduino. Yes, it's an Arduino Due. And it's you. You told us that the sampling rate must be extremely high to to really make stuff like that. This continuation mm -hmm. thing. Well, the, sam the sampling rate is, is adaptive. Actually, the way okay. we got it to work is that on the initial touch, when a touch starts, it will sample very quickly. Mm -hmm. It will sample at uh, what is it again? 25 microseconds. Oh, okay. So the initial the initial uh, ramp will be very detailed, and then usually people start when they when you articulate in once your initial ramp is done. Okay, then it's then oh, usually okay. you you model your sound in a in, in a more expressive in a slower fashion. Mm -hmm. um, so and then the sample rate backs off a bit, and then it goes to let me calculate. I think I don't remember actually because I've had so many figures. <laughs> uh, what is six? Yeah, I'm not going to say... Well, it's, it, it's yeah. not that important, but... Uh, but, but it's still fast enough that you can articulate the, 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 the sustain phase and the release phase. Okay. Um, which, in general, also in acoustic instruments, they have a little bit of hyster hysteresis. Mm -hmm. So if you let a string go, it will always have its own vibration to let right. go. So we're used to uh, everything that happens after to the attack to be a little bit flexible, and that feels natural. What about that... that sounds to me like this is an instrument made by musicians. It because is. we have to really understand right. yes. what, is, what music is all about yeah. to, to build that, right? Right. So the guy that invented this, the hardware here, so that's why it's called um, Linstrument here. So it's called Roger Lin. Um, people that were around in the 80s will probably remember Roger Lin because he designed the first digital drum machines. Oh that were used by Michael Jackson on his Thriller album, they were used by Marvin Gaye, they were used by Prince, actually the sound of Prince, his digital sound came from the instrument. Oh, okay. Um, and then he moved on after that to create one of the first pad devices that you see being mm -hmm. used by DJs, so four by four pads, which are disconnected, not continuous yeah. like here. Um, and that device was called the MCP. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so you can see most DJs and hip hop artists work with that, and that's got him even bigger fame. Um, and then he noticed that because he, he's a guitar player by trade, he, okay. he toured initially with quite, quite a few people. Um, he, he, he wrote some songs. One of them got a, a hit for Eric, Eric Clapton, for, for, oh. for instance. So he's very well versed in the musical world, um, and he thought it was about time that he made an expressive instrument because he was always focusing on drums and on beats and he felt a bit bad that um, his MCP stuff sort of enabled DJing and hip-hop getting rid of the notes and all toward beats um, and so that is why he wanted to do the okay. instrument. And then we got acquainted since I was working with the Agen Harp and we did a, a very nice tour of California together mm -hmm. where we went through all the music universities. We went to Sinmad, went to Berkeley. We did some uh, uh, sh shows at, 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 uh, at music stores there, at specialized music stores. And so we knew each other from the Agen Labs, the, from the Agen Harp work that I did. And then he was looking for someone to help him out. And I was very interested in better programming. I had never done it before. Okay. And that was a perfect opportunity to try to work together and to have you know, his expertise. Me also being a musician, 
trying to imagine how mm -hmm. the hardware would relate to the expressive nature mm -hmm. of a musical instrument. Um, and yeah, so and that started about, so he's, he's been working on it for four years now and I, I joined the product, uh, project a year ago. Oh, ah, okay. So that means, uh, if we come back to the Arduino stuff, because yes. that sounds really interesting right. to me. It's, uh, <laughs> I think most of the people here know what an Arduino is. I'm maybe I'm, I'm pretty sure people here in the audience also have Arduinos at home. And if you see an instrument like this, it's hard to believe to that, 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 really, that it really works. Yes. Because uh, you have this run loop and then if you have to do all the sampling stuff, and the, it, it must be very, very fast in reacting. In reacting. So I think... Um, Th th this could be the hardest part. Get the event handling right. Yes. So and, yes. and I, th I think you have some code that. Uh I can, we can go over a, bi a little bit of code. Um, yeah. Why this not? Is, this so is very improvised. So we'll see if it makes sense to you. It, so anyone has we, any questions? Maybe um, we have people here in the audience that yes. are interested. So let let's see what we have to show here. So. So this is um, this is the main Arduino file. Uh, so the instrument firmware dot. I know people that so are not it, by used. By the way, to is it open source? Yes, it's fully open source on GitHub. Oh, that's cool. Yes. So does it mean I could build my, my own instrument? Exactly. Wow. So that means. Well, also actually, no. The sensor itself. Oh, okay. Is not open source. Okay, but, but um, because there is this thing in. We as programmers, we're used to actually, and which is very unique in the in the programmer world nowadays. We're used to use open source in a. Um, in a nice way. So mm -hmm. very few people will steal, okay. right? Okay, yes. Um, yeah. they, they will give credit and con contribute and work together with people building uh, solutions. While in the music world, open source is not that prevalent, prevalent mm -hmm. yet certainly not on the hardware side. So there is this thing you have to be, you have to know that Yamaha, for example, or Roland are super big companies and if the sensor design would be open source, they would instantly put what, 20 engineers yeah, on right, it and right. build, build something that would be 10 times cheaper mm. and all the R&D that Roger did would go down the yes, drain. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I agree. So that's, but maybe, maybe eventually it will, it will happen. But well, the nice thing though is that, to get back to the Arduino, is it is actually an Arduino DUE on the circuit board and everything is done through the Arduino DUE, DUE's pins. And okay. uh, um, oh, that's digital amazing. pins so and, uh, and it's really hard and serial interface. Yeah. So every, wow. everything goes through there. So it is the heart of the whole system. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? It, we're, it's okay if we improvise a little bit. Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Let me see if if I can open my keynote from uh, that. I'm going to do my closing keynote. I have a picture there that might that might be interesting. Um, let's see if I can open it up. No, that's not it. Uh, oh, you actually can use that one. Um, <laughs> There was a session that I did at DevOx, which is recorded, by the way, that shows all the details about how to hack the instrument. Ah, okay. And so, so yeah. this, this, is, um, this shows the actual usage of the Arduino by the instrument. So you can see that it has... So this is the actual Arduino DUE. And you can see it here on the circuit board. So this is the board ah, of the okay. instrument, yeah. right? And so you can see the Arduino DUE chip on the left side. Um, which is embedded on the circuit board. And then in this slide, I show how everything is connected. So you can actually get uh, access to the serial peripheral interface. Mm -hmm. The signals come, th come through there uh, for the LEDs and the sensors. And then the foot pedals uh, are just digital on-off switches. Um, so, but but would, it, would it be possible to hack the instrument? Yes. So I can modify the code yes. in, in the instrument. It's yes. no problem? No. Nope. Wow, that's, that's yeah. nice. We actually went... Um, so, well, let's go back to the code because mm -hmm. there's, we, we can show something interesting here. So one thing we did though, so if you've never done any Arduino, um, Arduino code is set up in two, in two parts. You've got a setup part that is run at boot time. So this, this sets up your environment. And then it will con continuously call a loop function, which I have down here, which you, you want to try to call as fast as possible. Sure. You know, get out of there as quickly as possible so that it can do it very quickly, yeah. certainly if you want to do something expressive. Um, but so in the setup function, we did, for example, this whole part in the beginning. And you can see that we, we went through a huge effort to try to comment the code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this initial part uh, tries to take care of people that make mistakes. 
Okay. So if you uh, hack the instrument and get it into a state that it cannot be connected through serial interface anymore, you could do that. You okay. could um, set the switches wrong so that it will not activate the serial peripheral interface anymore, right? We have a special boot up okay, mode understand. that if you press this switch zero, which is, you look at the instrument, this switch okay. at startup, it's going to go instantly into, ser into firmware update mode. Ah, and so you, you can a, flash it a again. Backdoor to, oh, yeah. okay. oh, that's good. And then if you still, if you manage to not read the comments here <laughs> and rag that part, we've got a switch on the circuit board that allows you to force it into OS update mode also, oh, okay. but then you'll have to open it up. Ah, okay. So but at least you can But you, you will not, not brick it, which <laughs> is the nice, yeah, nice that's, part. That's important. So, by the way, how much is that instrument? Uh, $1,500. Oh, that's not too much for it's such an instrument. Yeah. Wow. So, we've got the setup code here that basically sets up typical stuff. You know, it's, it just in initializes all the data structures. Mm -hmm. um, it makes sure it's ready to receive sensor information. And then, in, then we've got the lo loop here, which the most interesting part here is the performance loop. So, it calls oh, out. Okay. So, we've got two other loops here, one for the firmware update mode that I just mm -hmm. mentioned. Got another loop here specifically. If you press another button, it will go into another test mode so that people at the factory can easily test, have a very established test plan to see oh, okay. if everything works. But the interesting part is for musicians and hackers, the l performance mode. And this is actually the main part of it. So what it does is it will call out to a method here for each. So the, the, the general design is it will go over each and every cell. There are 200 of those mm -hmm. as fast as possible. So it will scan over that. It's a little bit like a beam on a screen, mm -hmm. right? So it will scan over it. And it will try to sense as fast as possible the pressure. That's the initial reading that it does. Okay. So one thing you have to realize, though, is the way that the, that, that the hardware is designed. And I never realized that before. I, will, I, I learned this stuff. <laughs> a year ago, um, I never realized that you actually, it's, it sounds stupid when, I, when you say it, but <laughs> that you actually have to send electricity through hardware for it to work. Yes. So <laughs> Makes sense. Yes, it makes <laughs> sense. But the thing, though, is if you've got a sensor, for example, like this, you cannot have electricity going on everywhere at the same time. That's correct. So the way you get a sense, all these sensors to work is by switching the, 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 the voltage streams do different sections on the on the circuit board. Uh -huh, so okay. you actually you have this grid of uh, uh, switches that you can mm -hmm. set so that the voltages have a cord. And it's a, it's a little bit like playing battleships. You see, you say, okay, this is gonna be C4. Yeah, I hit the boat, right? So you have to set the coordinates so that you send the voltage to the cell that you mm -hmm. want to measure. But and then that was another thing that I never realized before. Electricity is not instant. That's true. But you, th you never realize that when you work as a programmer, no, because not. we work on these things. But so it takes a few microseconds for the voltages to stabilize and to provide a stable reading. So that is actually what the main loop here does. Mm -hmm. It will, as fast as possible, go over all these readings, and it calls out eventually. Uh, it will, it will ent en enter this uh, sensor file where it, does, it re reads the Z axis, so the pressure. Okay. And it will delay 11 microseconds. So what it does, so it selects the sensor cell. So this is super low level. It will use the coordinate that I just said, so the x, y position, like playing battleships. Um, so it calls out to this, this function here, where it sends the data to the serial peripheral interface so that that can actually switch the voltage streams for the sensor. And once that is done, it waits. It waits for 11 microseconds for it to stabilize. To, to settle and then, oh, okay. And then it's going to read back from another serial peripheral interface what the analog to digital converter of the sensor will report back. Yeah. And then I get a value, and that value is my pressure. Right? Oh, that's, that's cool. And so you got an inherent um, latency of 11 microseconds for each read. 
meaning with 200 cells, it will, it will add up to between two and, thri two and three uh, milliseconds before you've done mm -hmm. the round trip, right? So there is a little bit of jitter there between, you've got about three milliseconds of but jitter. But is it something you can feel when no. playing? A human being, um, well, this is research that is, some people try to dispute it, but I've never personally felt anything below 10 milliseconds, but mm -hmm. they say that anything in terms of jitter, I'm not talking latency, but mm -hmm. jitter, between six milliseconds, you can't feel it. Okay. So it's well, be, well within those boundaries. Um, and so then it waits, it gets, it gets that data, and that is what actually happens in this first if statement. So it just, it checks if the pressure data was meaningful. Mm -hmm. Something you also don't realize if you first start doing this stuff is just holding it like that. Yeah. You will get pressure data. Sure. Because the sensor is measuring things and you will get fluctuations all over. If you press down here, it will influence all the other cells and you have some hysteresis there also, mm -hmm. meaning that even if you stop it, you still have some readings on other cells. So there's some logic in there to have thresholds and some okay. slopes. So you take that into yes. account? So yeah, okay. So that is done by the is meaningful touch uh, method of the sensor cell. And once it, de it determines that that touch was actually on purpose, mm -hmm. then it's going to start processing it. Um, and so you've got three states. So this is the initial touch. This is when a touch is going on once you've decided, okay, I'm going to work with this one, mm -hmm. then it's going to continuously handle the updates of the X, Y, and Z position. And then the third state is, okay, I released my finger, and now the touch can be released. Wow. So that's basically how it's structured. Now, the main part, and these, so these two bottom ones are, um, they can be a little bit slower. This one has to be as fast as possible, because okay. it will cause this loop, this main loop that is called over and over again, it will cause it to s dramatically slow down or not. And if you get it fast, then everything becomes super responsive. If it's slow, then sure. you'll feel delay. Yeah. And that is, that is sort of, that is directive of the whole design, I think, of a, a expressive and responsive uh, embedded uh, device development in that you have to think about segmenting your logic. Mm -hmm. how, how can you cut it up in the smallest possible pieces to transit from one state to the other and back out as soon as possible? While doing desktop development, you'll have multiple threads yeah, running you and have, you just yeah. accumulate state and you make... It's a whole different programming paradigm. So, so, so why was the decision made to take uh, an Arduino? Because people know it. That was so really the yes, intention? Yes, it was okay. the intentional design to be able to open source it and to have a, a platform that is suitable for open sourcing. Um, so, but that, that code might be very interesting for people interacting with hardware because yes. this is made for, for performance. Yes. And um, I think there are not many books, if there are books at all, that cover such stuff. So yeah, it, probably not. I think so it's was it, uh, I, I can imagine it was a lot of try and error. A lot of trial and, and actually, measuring and, and, and the thing that I just explained initially, um, measuring the initial slope very fast and then backing off. I only figured that out a month ago. Okay. Initially, we weren't doing that, and it was playable, but I could feel s small delays, and because I was still thinking the way that we constructed the Eigenharp, which mm -hmm. is that one reads and then it sends everything over and then it generates MIDI on the computer, so. Initially, I'm, I structured things more like that. But then I realized, since I've got an embedded CPU in the device, I can actually uh, adapt the sampling rates. And that, that is now making it extremely responsive and fast. So, and but is the development still going on? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you are still working on? Still working on it. This is, this is what I do in my spare time, which goes okay. on until 2 AM every day. <laughs> Well, that, that sounds really interesting. So it's, um, I think we are. Let me see if I can put up the GitHub page or the Oh, yeah, URL yeah, that would least. be great. So there is this presentation. So um, this one, so Linstrument, the ultimate open source hacker instrument, oh, okay. has been, so I recorded that one uh, DevOx mm -hmm. at the end of the year, so a few months ago. It is on my YouTube channel, together with all the slides. And so what it does, it, it goes over everything you just mentioned. Um, so it, it, it highlights the, the hardware, how everything is structured, 
Oh, that's nice. It, it, it doesn't have the backing out thing because I only realized that one month ago. But what it, what it does, though, is it's got a whole bunch of, um, which are quite interesting, uh, where is it here? Specific examples about how we had to solve problems. Like, how do you do per finger touch tracking? Oh, that's nice. So, that also never occurred to me, but a sensor is just a sensor. It has no intelligence. Y yeah, it just right. puts out <laughs> x, y coordinates. Now, if I want to have a surface, mm. and I put my finger down, these are all different positions, right? So somehow I have to know when I do this that it's going to be the same finger. Right. And I put a second one down, it has to be the same finger, and all the way up to 10 fingers. Um, Initially, we modeled it as, so one, what, there's one restriction in the design, though, is you can only have one finger on each square. So, well, okay. So initially, uh, we structured it in a very similar way as we would do in Java by creating uh, a map of touches that would then uh, keep their state and be, I have to somehow figure out when, when it is timing out because like a session mm -hmm. and that was way too much uh, maintenance. Yeah. yeah, it's it's different if you code for that stuff. So what? So this for so in these slides, for example, what it explains is that it actually just um, since each sensor can only have one touch going active, as soon as you move to another sensor, that is the only piece of logic. It detects when a finger transits to a new cell. Okay. And by comparing the relative pressure and. Uh, Sm small delay you can have on switching oh, to another really cell. You really compare the, yes. the pressure between those. Oh, okay. And then it transits. It say, okay, this finger is going to that cell, and so the data structure stays fixed. So you it detect the finger really yeah. on the on the sensor yes. grid. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's nice. By and so there is no memory allocation. There is no data churn. It only just flips bits. But to say do you have some kind of finger interference if you play it with more than? If you play it with five fingers, I can imagine if they get close to each other, and then there could be moves where you move well, both fingers, and then the, is it, it hard it, to track the fingers? No, it wasn't. It wasn't that hard. I think oh. Roger did a real good design in in the sensor. Um, there were you have to analyze, and the, well, I like doing that. I like um, I did that on other projects also. I did some gesture control stuff that we talked mm -hmm. about before uh, in, in other conferences. I like just sitting down and watching the data pass by, <laughs> and. And I think that is the first thing, actually, to do when you're trying to come up with algorithms or designing a new product that is tied into the physical world. Finding some kind of patterns in that Yes, data trying, stream, yeah. trying to see the matrix. <laughs> right? Everything just goes down the stream and just watch it and interact with the device. Try to imagine what you want to have happen. But it's not happening yet, but try to recognize the patterns in the data stream. Mm -hmm. Because most probably what, what you think would be happening is not happening. <laughs> and so any design you build on assumptions will probably be wrong. OK. Uh, that, so yeah, so yeah I, I like watching data. <laughs> <laughs> and then draw some graphs out of it, try to come up with some real-time gra graphs that you mm -hmm. can just see. Because having something visually drawn out also yeah, helps. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. absolutely. And yeah, so these slides, they go, they go through um, uh, some, some of the dif di difficult things that we had to solve. Mm -hmm. um, that are partly due to the Arduino still being a slow, a slow embedded CPU, but fast enough, right? Just fast yeah, enough. Yeah, and, and, and it has really good timings, so which is yes. uh, very That's, important yes, for that. Yes, very important. So you can say, make a pause for 11 milliseconds, and yep. it will be 11 milliseconds. 11 mi yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's a very big difference with, um, well, most Java developers, also I had to learn about that. An Arduino or any embedded device always runs at 100% of CPU. Yeah, yeah. That never <laughs> occurred to me. Well, desktop CPUs, they always back off and they, they lower their voltages to run slower when they don't have yeah. to. While an embedded device is always full steam, steam ahead. So that's a constant. It's your code that's going <laughs> to influence the speed of what's going on. It's yeah. never going to be the CPU. It's your code. Which is a nice feeling, actually, because you really have that interaction. Yeah, I can imagine that this. Uh, I had the same experience when I started with the embedded Switch. things, and uh, then um, moving from stuff like the Pi or, or things like that to an Arduino, it's you feel, oh, wait a minute, that's it's totally different. It's yes. and, and it's fun because it it's more. 
it's more reactive. It's not you, you don't build all this stuff around it. You go directly. Yep. So the code is more direct. The code is uh, and it's totally, totally different to from the, the stuff that we learned yep. how to code because this is coding hardware. It's a, it's a different story. But still, I I was surprised at how well um, Atmel were able. So Atmel are the people that make Arduino. Were able to. Um, extract an API that is so concise and compact with uh, 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 their library, their general runtime library is actually, to me, the perfect scope. It, everything fits on one page. Yeah. <laughs> and you can build, well, musical instruments with them. And they, yeah, never, that, even, really and, and they never even designed it for that. Yeah. So that, I think that's kind of proof that they, you know, they did a really good job there. I saw it really shows that uh, you can do Nearly everything is with this buzzword IoT. So this this is a perfect example. No, if you see the the Arduino, nobody would think about like an of yep. an instrument like that, right? Yes. So it, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. I think that was uh, very interesting, at least for me. I hope also for the audience because I'm very interested in that stuff. And it was a pleasure to have oh, you here. Thank and, you very uh, much. Yeah. I and hope. Oh, and you will have the the ending keynote, right? Yes. So will we see keyboard. the. The instrument. I'll, I'll try to play it. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> so you'll have to indulge my errors because it's been released two months ago, and okay. I've been coding so much on it that I only started practicing five days ago. So okay. Oh, so well, that will be interesting. Well, so everybody you can who's here, don't take any tomatoes with you. <laughs> <laughs> Attend the, the ending keynote, and then you will see the instrument, the instrument in action. Okay. Thank thanks. you.